do it. There we go. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to From Hell to Happiness. This is day four. This is the last interview of day four. And I think this is yeah. interview number five today. I don't know. It's like, blah, blah, blah. I'm there now. <laughs> I'm already there. Uh, so I just want to once again say thank you to everybody who's joined up until this time, who's watched the videos, who's commented, engaged, and offered support to the women who have shared their stories. There, there have been some incredible stories um, and the vulnerability and the bravery and the courage of these women who are sharing these stories just is just amazing. So for those of you that are that have been here watching the videos, thank you so, so much. Those of you that have shared, thank you. I appreciate each and every one of you truly from the bottom of my heart. Uh, we're going to get right into today's, the last video of today. This is uh, my friend Karen, and I've known Karen for probably about five years and we also met in a Facebook group of Facebook of online entrepreneurs and I've never actually really spoke to Karen a couple of messages every now and again but nothing really um, yeah. of any kind of depth or anything so this is the first time I'm actually meeting and speaking to Karen and we've been chatting a little bit before and she's lovely so I can't wait to hear Karen's story she sounds like she's got a ton a valuable um, information and wisdom to share. So I'm super, super excited. Karen is going to be sharing her story of breast cancer um, and some things she learned along the way, some of her life experiences. So Karen, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. I, I thank truly, you so much, Iva. It's I, such a blessing to be here and share the opportunity to inspire others from what we've experienced ourselves. I think yeah. that's really important. That's a gift you're giving so many people. So yeah. thank you. Yeah, thanks. I'm just, you know, and we're just going to get right into it. Um, I'm so we are talking about your breast cancer. So just bring us all the way back to the day, either the day you found out or the day something might have prompted you to actually go and get checked because maybe you thought you had breast cancer. Let's just take us right back to there. And I'm just going to let you have the floor. Awesome. I'll start the story with the definition of what is trauma, because for some people, this topic and the content of my topic may induce trauma, which is a distressing or disturbing experience. And you're going to hear me talk about experience a lot. So it's literally about this time two years ago that I was on a family holiday on the other side of Australia. As you can tell from my accent, I'm, I'm Australian, mate. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and my name's Karen Double Whammy. <laughs> and uh, because I'm a natural therapies practitioner, I've trained in the use of Australian bushflower essences. I forced my family to go to the Perth Botanic Gardens and meditate amongst the wildflowers and the bushflowers because the essences have a feeling, but it's lovely to get into nature and sit with the plant itself and commune. And it's, it's always interesting and I always get the goosebumps um, because when I was sitting amongst this stand of these tiny, tiny little flannel flowers, which helps you connect with spirit, I had spirit step in and say to me, put their hand on my shoulder and say to me, darling, there's something not right. No. And I'm like, okay, do I need to deal with it now while I'm here in Perth near a hospital? No, as soon as you go home, you need to get this check straight away. And I just knew, I just, and I've, because I have had dense breast tissue before and larger breasts, I've had issues with lumps and bumps and cysts. And I've always gone and got them checked, but this time I just knew something wasn't right. And so I had this hour-long conversation. Well, it felt like an hour. My family were bugging the crap out of me. Come on, let's go. And I'm like, I'll meet up with you. I'm in the middle of something. And I just had a conversation with Spirit about, will I be okay? Um, and I think what's very normal for any person, male or female, is when we have an experience of that awareness, that gut feeling, Mm -hmm. of something's not right we have that spark of fear arise yes. yes and spirit reassured me in the long run I'm going to be fine but I'm about to embark on a life-changing journey and I'm like well you've got my back so I'm going to be okay you're going to be okay we're with you every step of the way but please promise me you go and get it checked so I went about my holiday had a great time within the back of my mind bearing in mind I had no physical symptoms okay 
So I get home, book in for a mammogram. Three weeks later, go and have a mammogram. In, out, eight minutes. Bob's your uncle. Ten days later, I get a call back. You need to have a biopsy. There's something not right on the image. Spirit steps in. It's okay. It's okay. Go back. Have the biopsy, which is somewhat different to a mammogram, where the mammogram will um, image the breast to as much as you can physically tolerate. Right. The biopsy right. will flatten the tissue as much as possible to flatten so that the biopsy needle can be acquired on the exact area whilst they're imaging. Oh, okay. Now, for me, now this might trigger people, so just sit with your emotional stress release points on, front and back of your head. When I was in the mammogram biopsy machine, the machine broke down with the needle in me and I was stuck in it for about an hour. Oh, the needle the was in relief, you. Mm, the pain relief didn't work, so I was still wedged in the machine. I'm going to move beyond that experience because, as you can imagine, that's, that's very triggering for some people to hear and it's triggering for me too, and I ended up with PTSD. A week later, I go back for my biopsy results and um, three hours of waiting for my appointment to arise, I was told um, I had DCIS, which is ductal, karma, ductal carcinoma in situ, which is that pre-cancer. Okay. Um, and I had the surgeon just talk to my chest, not make any eye contact. And I'm happy to say that since that time, I've liaised with the screening service and they now have a new system whereby they have trauma-informed care and procedures and trained staff. Oh, good. And that's been rolled out throughout all of Victoria and it's about to be introduced as a national minimum care objective for all of Australia. Wow, that's awesome. So that's one of my take-home wins from that experience is that I, whilst I didn't get anything positive out of that experience other than the gift of early diagnosis, mm -hmm. I have been able to activate change for other women. And for me, that's a very good take home. Moving along, it just so happened that I had caught up with a friend from primary school, or sorry, high school, a couple of months prior to my diagnosis. And she was raving about how her sister had just had a second breast cancer experience and the surgeon, she was raving about this surgeon. And because I'd had this warning from spirit, because I had the heads up, I felt very calm and I reached out to her and said, hey, Cal, who did your sister go and see? And she goes, oh, go and see Dr. Jane O'Brien. She's the bee's niece. And for me, I live in a regional area. That was a two and a half hour drive just to go and see Jane. Anyway, it's so, it's so synchronous how some things just unwind. <laughs> Got the diagnosis. I preemptively had booked a, an appointment with my GP to get a referral to just get things going because I'd known all along something wasn't right. Went to the GP, who do you want to see? I want to go and see Jane O'Brien. Rang up Jane O'Brien. So this is two hours after diagnosed. Ring up Jane's office. Are you such and such as friend? Yes, we've got an appointment waiting for you in two days. Wow. Right up the entire afternoon because if I know Jane, she'll want you to have an MRI. By this stage, it's actually very normal that your head is spinning. Oh, my God, I've got cancer. I was just going to ask you, what were your emotions like during this whole ordeal yeah, already? Yeah. Okay. It was, it's intense because the spiritual side of you knows that you're going to be okay. I was relieved that on the mammogram imaging and the biopsy result that they were able to get showed it was contained. Okay. When I went to have the MRI... It showed triple the length of ductal carcinoma with a patch in between. So say the, your um, mammary gland and the lymphatic drainage between the glands, there was a space in between that they didn't know what it was. And so I had a, I had CAT scan. I had a, I, I lost track, honestly, the amount of blood they took out of me and the amount of imaging. It was just a blur because once you get yeah. diagnosed, the medical machine takes over and you're assigned a breast care nurse and a surgeon and a this and a that. And a, my head was spinning. Okay. But the okay. gift of early diagnosis is that you have a lot of treatment options. So I went to see Jane and she's very much like me. No nonsense. 
here's all your options. It's your body. What do you want to do? And I loved that about her. And so I asked a lot of questions. I'm an industrial chemist. I've done biology. I'm an environmental scientist. I'm a kinesiologist. I'm a neurobiologist. I had a lot of questions for her about biochemistry and surgical recovery. And since that time, I think that's one of the few things that that's one of the gifts that spirit gave me is that heads up that I was of sound mind that I had three pages of questions and I'm one of those ones who I didn't need to read it on paper I couldn't read anything I was still quite traumatized by the biopsy experience right, but right. I could respond when I heard and so that's one of the things that experience gives us is it turns on our survival program. Right. And so right. one of the things, if you have recently been experienced or have a loved one, is find out where your triggers are. Are you triggered with written word and can't read and absorb anything? Or are you triggered with confronting people? You need to see people like you and I now are dialoguing. Right. Or can you do it all over the phone? So understand what your trigger is so that when you do take your support person, they're going to hear everything and you're going to hear snippets that trigger that survival program. Interesting. That's very interesting. That makes a lot of yeah. sense. Yeah. It does, doesn't it? And yeah, so sure. within uh, eight days of seeing Jane, I had the first of six surgeries. Okay. So because I had large breasts and because spirit had whispered, you're going to have to take drastic action, deep down I knew I didn't want a lumpectomy because that would mean having to get into another machine and be, I'll call it manhandled to get the core biopsy. I just couldn't tolerate that. And I knew deep down the imaging wasn't showing everything. I, just, I can't explain why. And even now when I talk to Jane and the oncologist, Rick, they still say, whatever you do, always trust your gut because you were smack on. So I chose for a mastectomy and I thought, well, I've got big boobies and I've always put it out there. You know, I've had Titanics and I want little motorboats. <laughs> so that was the joke that I said, well, I'd, I'd like to, you know, park the Titanics and I want the little motorboats. And Jane and the <laughs> surgeon, Ed, looked at me and goes, what's a motorboat? And I go, you know, when you're in the water and the little motorboat goes, did it, did it, did it. I said, oh, my God, did it. He roared with laughter. <laughs> and that was the joke I told when I went under for the mastectomy reco. So I had a mastectomy reconstruction on the right and a reduction on the left. Okay. I woke up with 145 centimetre suture line. I think it was five drains a catheter, two IVs, and I didn't move for three days because of all of the tubing in me. It was just wow. very intense. So the first surgery was nipple sparing to try and keep as much of me as possible. Okay. But because of the damage from being in the biopsy machine for so long, I had a lot of tissue necrosis or die off. And so he took as much skin from my tummy as he could. So that made rehab very long. So that was an eight to 10 week recovery. And then um, my third surgery was the nipple that we tried to spare. The, the skin died, so I had to have a nipple debridement and have had a massive infection, so I had to have that all reworked. Oh, no. And then we got the results of the pathology. And Jane sat on the bed and I thought, oh, God, this is just awful. And just replaying it, I just pictured that fear of not being able to sit in a ceremony and watch my daughter get married or hold her child and the fear of not having that I thought oh this is really serious and she said well we've got it early it hasn't hit the nodes but you do have it's invasive and you've got it very early so here's all of our options and so we talked out the options and she said it's just before Christmas. The oncologist is about to go to San Francisco for an oncology conference, but I've told him, God love her, I told him he's to see you before he leaves. So he saw me at 9 o'clock on a Sunday morning. He came in and gave me an hour of his time on the ward while I was still recovering, and we spoke about all of my options in terms of chemo, in terms of radiation, my medical background, because I have a history of autoimmune and liver challenges, and I'm just going to dab my eyes because I've got to, just the, every time that I think about not seeing my daughter, I've worked so hard after four miscarriages, I worked so hard to get her here, and the thought of not seeing her grow and nurture her as she's continuing is just 
gut-wrenching. I and I think you. that's one of the biggest fears that a cancer patient experiences is that fear of the unknown and uncertainty of what actually dies is your expectation of the life you thought you would live is just immediately taken off you and you have to redefine yourself. Right, of course. Of course. And that's very confronting because it's not, oh, well, well you know, we're going to make you redundant and, he's, you know, that's not going to happen straight away. You've got some time and we'll try to redeploy you. It's, bam, this is what you've got and these are the statistics. And it's like, wow. holy fire trucks. Wow. It's massive. It's so confronting. And you have your fear and then you have the fear of your daughter looking at you. And the fear of your husband who's not coping because he's got his own stuff going on and right. the fear of your family and then having um, surgeries in Melbourne away from the family. So no visitors. Right before Christmas, everyone's busy. My, thank God for my best friend. That's all I'll say. And I had some lovely friends come and see me in the hospital and give me some kinesiology and, you know, really give me a lot of healing. And what got me through those first three weeks of surgery was I had a tribe and this was the first time I'd called them in and I don't normally ask for help. And I just was inundated. The week I was diagnosed, I was cancelling clinic and I was, and it, it leaked out um, before I could get in front of it. And I had someone locally call me and say, are you leaving your husband because you're cancelling clients and la, la, la. Yeah. No, I've just been diagnosed with breast cancer. Oh my God. Again, another experience that contributes to the trauma of what you're dealing with. Right. And so what I decided to do was I went, you know what? Profanity. Fuck it. I'm going to get on live. I'm going to do a live stream on my social media and I'm going to broadcast it to my audience. Clinic is shut indefinitely. This is why I've been diagnosed. And this is where my head is at. And I was very calm. I got a little bit teary. It was very, but they got to see the emotion. It was so much more powerful than an email to my audience. And what I didn't realize at the time was that every bit of love that I'd ever given out in my clinical environment that night or those three or four days afterwards came flooding back. I think I got over 600 messages. Oh my God. Either on messenger, text, email. So Aww. many people reached out or put comments on the live, and I sat there and bawled my eyes out because I'm like, it's so overwhelming to have all of that love come at you. And what it did was it taught me that experience taught me I'm worthy and I deserve that. And it just amplified my ability to project love. And I went, right, that's it. Fuck it again. <laughs> this is how we're going to do it. And it was at that moment. I decided to embrace the experience of cancer rather than fight it. And that was very profound for me. So everyone's saying, how's the fight going? Oh, I'm not fighting. Oh, but you're doing surgery and you're doing chemical. Yes, I'm using treatments to reinstate my health. And I think you um, interviewed Eileen Scott earlier in the week. She's a very good friend of mine, very dear friend and hypnotherapist. Mm -hmm. And I said to her, I need your help to get my head around chemo because spirit's guiding me. Like normally I would say no way, but she says, Kaz, that's going to be your magic medicine. I've got a funny feeling this is far worse than what you're telling us. What year it is. It's, I'm going to need chemo. And um, I'll need some receptor treatment because I had a triple positive, triple hormone positive cancer. And she goes, okay, well, why don't we just have a hypno session that just keeps you calm and puts you in the mindset of not only have you got this, but every time you have chemo, you're taking your magic medicine and it's for your highest good. And I went, done, let's do that. This is how I embrace the experience. So I made chemo my bitch. And every time that I went on the chemo ward, I had different dress-up hats. I had them in stitches. By week three, <laughs> all of the staff would put their head out of the cube and go, she's here, she's here, what's she wearing today? <laughs> and we just laugh. And I'd build up the endorphins and because I still had to be able to drive home. I think it was week two chemo, COVID kicked in. So my support people then couldn't be on the ward with me. I was all alone. And I use that as me time. 
I meditated, I journaled, I wrote love letters, I planned my funeral just in case because, you know, that's what Karens do. We're super <laughs> organised, you know, and I, and I used that time to love myself. And a lot of the time I'd sit there with the pastoral care or they're called pastoral care people here. You might have them as social workers or counsellors mm -hmm. and they'd often gravitate and we'd sit because often treatment with chemo for me was six hours because I had the cap cooling as well. And they'd gravitate back to me still. I just want to pick your brains because you're so positive. I said, no, I'm choosing that this is an experience. I'm not doing fear for this. It's happened. It is what it is. Right. You've got to embrace it. There's no point fighting it because that's survival energy. And I haven't come this far in my life to not thrive through this as well. Mm -hmm. And that links back to, you know, that definition we started with of trauma, which is a distressing or disturbing experience. If you choose to make an experience your own, and even though it's shitful and chemo makes you feel dreadful, mm -hmm. I met the most amazing people and I'm now an ambassador for that hospital for breast cancer and early detection. You know, I'm, it's, this is a, um, going to be launched next week, but I'm about to become a Screen for Me ambassador for our local health network Yay. of early detection saves lives. You know, since sharing my story, story, I know of 50 women who have decided I've had a symptom I've been ignoring for 12 months and I'm going to go and get checked. Six have been diagnosed. Wow. Huh. But huh. it's been early. Yeah. So yeah. instead of putting it off, they now have choice. Right. So it's just, you know, and, the, and then this is, you know, this whole experience of building. Now I'm at the stage of I've just returned to work and I'm building my resilience using pause points from all of the things that have happened because I've clearly I went to mediation with the screening facility and we've had lots of proactive discussion and they've made some amazing changes to their systems, to their staff training, to their patient care and they are now true advocates. Um, I've had that influence over all of my surgeons because I'm combative when I come out of a general anaesthetic. I've learnt now I tell jokes as I'm going under. So the day that I had my mastectomy, I knew they were going to be having a, an eight-hour surgery. So I thanked each and every one of them for working that shift, knowing they wouldn't be finishing until like 10 o'clock that night. And I said, thank you in advance. In case no one says thank you, I want to thank you for loving me today. And here's a joke to get us started. Why do breasts have nipples? Why? And they're all looking at each other going, oh, my God, she's here for a mastectomy. She's telling tip jokes. They have nipples because without them, there's no point. <laughs> <laughs> and so every time I'm coming out of a general anesthetic now, I wake up laughing. <laughs> so it's when you can understand how that trauma or the distressing, disturbing experience affects you, how it triggers you, that's like a change point where you have choice to be able to say, I can continue to survive mm -hmm. or I can make this an experience that I either win or learn from. Yeah. You don't ever lose. When you embrace an experience, you never lose. You either win or learn. Right. Do you, that's I really powerful. Yeah, I have an interesting question for you. And yeah. um, so I, I am of the mindset that all of the trauma and everything that happened to me um, happened to me for many reasons. One of them is because I'm a strong person. And one of them is because I my um, story is a survival guide for somebody else. So I believe that a lot of my trauma happened to me and for me so I could be a spokesperson for other yeah. people so I almost feel like it was like I was chosen yeah. to go through all the shitty things I've gone through in my life yeah. like I yeah. was chosen to to handle them because I could I'm strong enough to handle them and I have a loud enough voice to help people deal with those do you feel that way about yours absolutely you do absolutely. okay okay I, and I've been very open every step of the way you know taking pictures on the oncology ward because the conversations that I now have with people excuse me even though I might not be very active in clinic I'm just because of the PTSD and I've got ongoing physical fatigue 
I might not be very active in clinic. I'm just doing two clients a day, but I'm doing walk and talk chats in the afternoon. Just I'm really enjoying reconnecting with people because in Victoria, we've been in lockdown for over 250 days. It's just insane. Really? So, Holy shit. Yeah. Oh yeah. My God. So it's, yeah, it's very intense. And last year was nearly all lockdown as well. So where possible, I get out in my exercise bubble and we have social distancing, we have our masks and we just walk and people join me for a walk. So what I find is the more we can demystify cancer and that topic of conversation, it's a bit like talking about poo. We all do it. Yep. We all have cancer cells in our body. Mm -hmm. And for most of us, if you're managing your stress and you have a good diet and your genes are good, <laughs> it won't be an issue. You'll just poo it all out and your liver and kidneys and spleen will deal with all of that and and it, it won't be an issue it's not until you have a trigger event that really activates anything whether it be Crohn's or asthma or arthritis or you know that affects yeah. then your gut mm -hmm. and then your leaky you develop a leaky gut and then you have a trauma response and it's you know it's all linked so I absolutely believe that this has been breast cancer. Most people look at me and go, you're crazy when I say breast cancer has been a gift. The things that I have learned about myself and the conversations that I have with people to just pause, use that resilience point and just pause and breathe and come back into themselves and remind them, you know what, in this moment, in this present moment, I'm okay. And when I'm okay, I have choice. I can choose to do treatment or not. I can choose to have surgery or not. I can choose to walk away or, and not engage with that person who's triggering me. I can choose to not watch the news. I can choose. I can choose because choice is empowering. I can choose to live from my heart and not in my head. I can choose to slow down and enjoy what COVID has brought me. Life instead of that busy pace. Right. And I think when you stop and calm down, because a lot of us act, we react, right? And we don't yeah, think that's survival before program. we act. Yeah, so I think if if we stop and just take a big deep breath and calm down and, and kind of step away from the from the event and look at it from the outside and go, okay, you know, I'm okay, yeah. I got this, I got this. It's, it's not it's yeah. not going to be as bad as I think it's going to be. Instead of yeah. going in and freaking out, oh my God, I'm dying. If I go, oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Instead of doing that, reacting, yeah. Yeah. just take back and just sit back and be calm and go, all right. And I know, I mean, obviously it's not going to be easy to, you know, when somebody just told you you have cancer and then to be calm, because I can't, I couldn't imagine, be, well, I probably could. I'd be like, okay, well, whatever, let's just do it, right? I mean, what are your choices? You have it and deal with it. So, yeah. yeah or totally, you don't. Or you don't. And, it, and it's interesting because I think one of the lessons that I have learned is that I now know you, you, it doesn't matter what I do, what happens around me, we all have stuff. We all have the ability to run survival programs. It's part of our neurology. It's We've got this caveman response in us to keep us alive. Yeah. It actually drives you to get out of bed. So you need it to a point, you know, to meet the deadlines, to get the kids to school on time. But you don't want to be running that elevated fear. And so all of these experiences dip into the trauma pool, which brings your threshold for being resilient down. Right. And this is what's motivated me to write a book, which I hope to launch before Christmas, is you can have these negative experiences in life that leave you feeling raw and vulnerable and unworthy and undeserving, but you've got no voice. There's no power there. You only squeak. And it's not until you take that breath and turn off the survival program and get out of your head where it's only thoughts, there's no love energy here, it's right. all here in your heart. When you come down, when you stop dissociating, when you connect with your heart resonance, yeah. that's when you roar and it doesn't have to be loud. Right. It's I am what I am. Yeah. I love that. That's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. Yeah. I can't wait to, for your book. That sounds, that's freaking super awesome. That makes two of us. Yeah. <laughs> 
so um so tell us a little bit of, so i i just want to to close here did you have any um anything more to add to your um to the trauma and the breast cancer or can we um just sort of segue into um if you have any advice or any tips or anything to share with any women at this time who may who just I found think, out that they have cancer yeah. who's going through that if you could just share yeah. a little bit that'd be yeah great. i think I think that the big take home for me is don't think you can do it alone because your entire tribe is affected by your diagnosis. Right. Of Call course. them in. The only way that they, they can't do surgery for you, they can't do the testing for you or the screening or the scanning or the treatment, but what they can do is little things like cook you a meal, clean your home, take your kids to school, run errands do some shopping you know what it's and when you allow them to show you how they love you yeah rather than oh they're doing me a favor and i owe all these favors it's not for fucking ever right i have 60 women in my tribe who all came together in the energy i almost didn't need pain meds because of the reiki and the love that i was getting from that group oh. And then I had a pool of 20 drivers because I had such significant um, abdominal surgery. I couldn't actually stand up straight for six weeks. So I couldn't wow. drive. Wow. It was really intensely painful. And I had to relearn because I'd had three kilos of breast tissue removed. Right. My entire gait changed. So I had to retrain my brain of, of how to actually stand up straight now that I could. Right. So I had to become very humble and vulnerable and allow myself when someone said, is there anything I can do? Go, you know what? Yes. And so in the end, make a timetable of all of the things that you do, knowing that you may not be able to do them and allow people to love you. I don't say allow them to help you. Allow them to show you how they love because they want to love you right now. And if this is what they can do by cooking a meal, let them love you. That, that awesome. would be my advice is allow the love to come back that you give out. That's awesome. And, and I love that because a lot, and I talked, I talked about this in quite a few li lives. So many people, oh, I can't bother anybody. Oh, I don't want to ask anybody. And, and we don't because yeah. I can't bother them. You know, they have enough problems. And I call bullshit own. on that. Yeah. That's just bullshit. fucking pick You're up the You're denying phone. them, yes. them loving you. I always tell everybody, yeah, people want to help. People love yeah. to, to be there for, for support. And how can yeah. I help you? People love to do that and don't deny yeah. them that give, let them yeah. have that, that opportunity where they can give you their gift of love yeah. and you're denying yeah. them of that. So I, I know yeah. I talk about that all the time. Just let yeah. call them, let people, you know, let people do their thing. That's quite confronting. I set up a private messenger group. Um, which would often, every time there was a diagnosis or an update, there'd be like ping, 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 and everyone's going, oh, my God. And right. Sometimes it was good, and other times what it meant was that I didn't have to share bad news multiple times. Right. I could dump it in this one spot, and it went out to the four corners of my world. Yeah. And yeah. so make your diagnosis as easy for you as possible because your job, if you've just been diagnosed, is to get well. Yeah. It's not to manage everyone else. So have someone you delegate to who just manages everyone else. Have a gatekeeper because your job is to recover. I love that. Thank you so much, Karen, for sharing My pleasure. your story. Thank you. So much for me. Um, and you have, so you, do you do online work or no, you don't? I do. So you I do. do a combination of face-to-face kinesiology clinical sessions i have online telehealth and we have the above and beyond membership program which we run through telegram okay and i have all your links to all that stuff right yeah right. and okay. i'm on and i have a podcast and oh. i have a blog you know i just i need to get out more do i have <laughs> Do I have all those links for all of that stuff? I think I do. So I will resend it today. <laughs> okay, perfect. So I'm going to yeah. drop, I'm going to find those links. And I'm going to drop them in the Facebook thread here for anybody who's thank watching you. or who will watch. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story. I, My love pleasure. Your, I love your energy and I love the way you think. Um, and I you. wish you, I wish you much success in the future and in your book launch. Please keep me posted thank on you. that. Um, oh, I will. Yeah. And thank you so much, Karen. 
Thank you so much. Everyone, remember, as always, you can choose to change and bloom from within. Thank you so much for having me, Ivor. I've loved this connection today. <laughs> I hope you. someone gets something out of it. Me too. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.